Well, good afternoon. Gosh, I knew I was at the funeral, but I didn't know it was that bad. Good afternoon. Ah, oh, well, thank God for that. Wasn't the choir beautiful? That's uh, the Forget Me Not Choir that Brendan did so much work with when he was alive. Uh, and they're here to pay a tribute to him, and they'll be, they'll be appearing at different times during our service today. So just, can I say at the beginning, if you're in a hurry, you better go now. Because we're just going to take a, a Dublin saunter uh, with the man who was the Dublin saunter. The lovely Noel Purcell song, which you just heard coming in, and which was a favourite of Brendan's as well. And that's the way he was welcomed into the church, which is exactly as it should be. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, there are various uh, uh, representations of Brendan here today. First of all, you'll see his large photo behind me here, which is Brendan Grace. And then we have um, his son, Butler. And you see Butler in front of the altar here. That's where Butler should be. And Butler is the word of God as Butler always was, the word of God for us. Before we welcome anyone, and we do that formally in a little moment or so, but first of all, we'd like to bring up some symbols of um, Brendan's life. And these are going to be brought up by his beloved and lovely and grandchildren of whom he was so, so proud, so proud of them. And they'll be here today, and Father Martin is going to help us with it. The first one um, is, would you believe, James Gillespie is going to bring a microphone. And this man is well used to a microphone because we've seen him before. You're not the man that asked Ryan Tuberty for the microphone, were you? No. That's lovely. Well, you know what that is. Brendan was always with the mic. And as he used to say, if you're going to heckle me, remember I have the mic. So it's the same today, by the way. If you're going to heckle me, I have the mic as well. And then we have um, Aidan Bradley Grace, uh, and uh, he's going to bring a book of Brendan's jokes, uh, an Amusing Grace, and My Favourite Jokes by Brendan. There are two books, which are Brendan's two books, as well as his autobiography there as well. And finally, there's a man, and we all know that uh, the beautiful singing voice that uh, Brendan had, as well as a wonderful comedian, and he had an extraordinary singing voice, as we all know. We just love listening to Brendan. And this is the guitar, and that's being brought to the altar by the wonderful Patrick Gillespie, his other, another of his grandson. And Father Martin, now, I don't know if you're any good on the guitar, Martin, but uh, I think we better place it on the mics, on the guitar stand, because it's a valuable piece of equipment. And um, as well as the beautiful symbols of his life, we now bring the symbols of his faith. We, we place as uh, the word of God uh, has been placed as Brandon lived by the word of God as best he could throughout his life. The word of God is a saving word and the word of God is an active word. The word of God does what it says it will do and there, it's the only word that is ever written that will do that. And we had a lovely crucifix. We'll, that'll, I'll mention that in the sermon later, not that particular crucifix, but the value of the crucifix, uh, because it was on the cross that Jesus died for us, Jesus saved us. The waters that flowed from the side of Jesus are, represent the waters of baptism, where Brendan was baptized here in the Liberties here, uh, and we were sprinkled with holy water as he came in the door of the church today. So the whole circle of life is represented in Brendan's baptism as a member of the Christian Church. Uh, and so we, we want to make that well today. Throughout our Mass today, we'll have memories, and, and we'll have thoughts, and we'll have reflections. Um, and intertwined, as in Brendan's life, the Word of God will be intertwined with the story of his life. Because the story of a person's life is the only story we have. And when we go to heaven, the story of my life is all I will have to offer to God. The gifts that God gave me are wonderful. What I do with those gifts are my only gift back to God. And Brendan used his life in a most wonderful and marvelous way uh, to, do, to do that throughout his life. I'm sure there'll be times when you want to cry. 
I'm sure there'll be times when you want to laugh. Wonderful. Be human. That's all we need to be. We don't need to be any more in God's presence than ourselves. God made us. We're fine the way we are. We don't have to change. We're fine the way we are. God loves us exactly as we are. So you can stand or sit whenever you like. If you want to go out for a smoke, that's fine. There's no collection, so it doesn't matter when you come back in. <laughs> and I was just thinking today, I, as I was coming in there and seeing the crowds, the beautiful crowds that greeted the wonderful Dublin Liberties boy himself as he came here, phenomenal crowds, and I just want to welcome those people outside. So maybe we who have got seats might give a little round of applause to those who didn't get seats. <laughs> Without any disrespect, I know exactly what Brendan is thinking at this moment. He's saying, what's the cover charge? <laughs> but it wouldn't be a great gig for him, wouldn't it? 60, 40 would do him here if he had this. Uh, so it would in the old ways. Now, can we welcome, uh, everybody's welcome. There's nobody who's not welcome. Uh, whether you're uh, a friend or family, whether you're just dropped in, it doesn't matter. If you haven't been in a church for ages, that's okay. You're here today, and that's the most important thing. And don't worry, just be yourself in God's presence. If you want to stand when everybody else stands, do. If you want to sit when everybody else sits, do. If you want to laugh, laugh. And whatever you do, just being human is quite enough to be in God's presence. But I'd like to, on behalf of the family, welcome um, the representatives of the, of the state here today. First of all, on behalf of President Higgins, we have Colonel Liam Condon representing uh, the Unicom for, for President Higgins. And beside uh, um, Colonel Condon, we have Commandant Caroline Burke representing the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar. Uh, and along with that, we have uh, Paul McAuliffe, uh, the Lord Mayor of Dublin. Uh, with his re representative as well. And of course we have Michal Martin as well, representing the, the party, uh, the leader of the Fine Fáil party. I see quite a number of uh, various parties here and we're delighted to see that. But most of all, I'm sure you won't mind if, see, if in my position, and I know all of us are thinking the same, I've been chaplain around the, the show business people for just 50 years now, just 50 years. And um, it gets sadder by the day. It does. And there are some wonderful long-time friends of mine and of Brendan's here that we met in all arts and parts of the country for, uh, for down through the last f 50 years that I've known them. And everybody's very sad today. Um, and for those, his friends in show business, who are still sad, who are still heartbroken, We've lost a lot of people. We've lost Big Tom, we've lost Jimmy McGee, we've lost Joe Dolan, we've lost Brendan Grace, and many others. And we all get a little vulnerable when we think of that. So guys and girls, from my friends, and the only friends I have in life, probably, the friends of show business, thank you for being here today, and thank you for getting over your grief so that you will be able to give Brendan the send-off that he deserves today. And you're doing that even though your hearts are breaking. So with Brendan, you went to a show, you laughed and you cried. It's the same today. We'll grieve and we'll laugh at the same time as we go through. And of course now we want to welcome especially the people who will miss him most in life. Uh, it's a family. And you know nobody knows the heartbreak. If we're heartbroken, can you imagine the heartbreak of the wonderful father and husband and grandfather that Brendan was? What's that doing to him? So to Eileen, Amanda, Melanie, Bradley, Brendan Patrick, to his sister Marie, or is it Marie? Marie, Marie, uh, and his beloved Aunt Wynne, who can't be here today. And the whole family circle, the grandchildren, the in-laws, and the wider circle, and of course, with Brendan, he didn't have friends and he didn't have fans. Both were the same thing. His fans were his friends and his friends were his fans. So to all of you, we welcome today. So in that spirit, uh, just join in the singing, raise the roof, make it lovely and beautiful to have it. 
and we just call to mind now our sins. Every time I met Brendan, uh, certainly in the last 20 years, every time I met him, and, and Eileen will know this, uh, wherever it would be, whether it be in a pub or a church, mostly pubs, um, I have to say, although not church as well, um, uh, uh, every time we met him, he, got, he wanted to do two things. Padre, give me the general absolution, please, in the corner. And when you have that done, bless me throat. So that was his two things that he always asked me to do, no matter where I was, uh, for the last God knows how many years. So in that sense, why don't we just recall to mind our own sins? There's nobody perfect, you don't have to be perfect. We're all vulnerable, we're all sad, we're all human, we're all going to die someday. We won't have a show like this for it, but we all die someday. Um, and it doesn't matter when we die, we're in God's presence, so it doesn't matter what happens after we die. So just think about that for a little moment. Just think about that. And don't be afraid, don't be full of fear, be full of hope and love and understanding. Nobody understands you better than God does, not even you. And God, gives everything. And we just have that and we we'll accept the absolution at the end of our, of our sins. So what do we need to think about? We need to think maybe we were uncharitable a lot of the times. We get tired, we get fed up when we get tired, we gossip when we do all sorts of things, but we don't really mean any harm by it. And so for those times when we need to ask forgiveness, Lord of mercy. For the times when we didn't help others as much as we could have, especially those who are suffering, maybe those who are suffering silently from something like depression or something that we don't see. Christ have mercy. And for all the times when we didn't even think of thanking God for the health and life and gifts that we have, for all those times we ask God's forgiveness. Lord have mercy. And the absolution then, just bow your head and ask for God's blessing. May Almighty God have mercy on us all, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And we'll be dropping in and out of prayers for Brendan, but the most important prayer is the one you have deep in your heart. So just do a little silence, a little quietness, out on the street or in here. And just think of a little prayer. Think of if you want to be grateful. Just, just think of something. The song, the beauty of the day, all of those things. O oh God, almighty Father, our faith professes that your son died and rose again, which is represented in the crucifix on, the, on this coffin. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant, Brendan, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him, who lives and reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And before the word of God, I'd like to represent and welcome, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say a great big, big thanks uh, to Father Martin Nolan, the parish priest here, who has been absolutely a gem, an absolute gem. And he's been so welcoming and he's put, gone to so much trouble. He and his whole community are with us today. You can see it. They've just come out to make us all welcome. That's a fantastic thing of a Christian community. So to Martin, thank you especially. But also for the other priests who have come to be with us uh, today, we have Father Dennis Hopper, who's from Glens, uh, Hooper, excuse me. <laughs> Dennis Hopper's the actor. Dennis Hooper. Uh, 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 Dennis Hooper, um, former rugby player, a great friend of all that. And, has been in Glenstall for years and years and was actually recently ordained, in fact, as well, from Glenstall. So, Dennis, you're most welcome. We have, Father, uh, we, have, we have a bit of a problem here because the next man is from Kerry, Father Teddy Linehan, from Tralee uh, Hospital. He's actually a Cork man living in Kerry, which must be difficult um, uh, these days, but not as difficult as the two men from Mayo. Uh, Monsignor Sean Kenny, and Father Mike and Harrison, two lifetime friends of Brendan's, and they'll be assisting me with the Mass today, so we welcome them. Now, the family went to great trouble, too. The Word of God is, again, it's the most consoling, wonderful thing, the Word of God. So, we're going to ask uh, Donna Gillespie uh, and uh, Kieran Myler uh, to come to the altar now with me uh, to read the Word of God. The first is from the Book of Wisdom, and this, you know, it's beautiful, the work of wisdom. This is just written two and a half thousand years ago, five thousand years before, before Christ. 
And then Paul's version to Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith, I have finished the race. Two wonderful examples of what it's about. And in between, the choir will come and sing. So come on ahead, uh, Kieran and um, um, Donna, uh, and Martin will look after you over there. The readings are in your pamphlets if you'd like to read them. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The virtuous man, though he die before his time, will find rest. Length of days is not what makes age honorable, nor numbers of years the true measure of life. Understanding, this is a man's gray hairs, untarnished life. This is ripe old age. He has sought to please God, so God has loved him. As he was living among sinners, he has been taken up. He has been carried off so that evil may not warp his understanding or treachery seduce his soul. For the fascination of evil throws good things into the shade, and the whirlwind of desire corrupts a simple heart. Come into perfection in so short a while, he achieved long life. His soul being pleasing to the Lord, he has taken him quickly from the wickedness around him. Yet people look on, uncomprehending. It does not enter their heads that grace and mercy await the chosen of the Lord and the protection of his holy ones. This is the word of the Lord.
once again the beautiful Forget Me Not Choir, and Bren did such lovely work with the Dutch man in his life. And I just see an old friend of Brendan's there in the midst of that choir, and a great Joe Cuddy. So it was lovely to see that. <laughs> A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Be careful always to choose the right course. Be brave under trials. Make the preachings of the good news your life's work in thoroughgoing service. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the fate. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Right? Right? Ask the Spirit. Will you stand up now, right? Butler, Butler, stand up, isn't it? It's a bit like that, isn't it? So we are specially chosen the reading from the gospel. Don't um, get second thoughts. You're not at a wedding. You're at a funeral. But there's a reading. But there's a reason for uh, this gospel. It's from the wedding feast of Cana. A reading from the holy gospel according to Saint John. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, or perhaps I should say Canaan in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. When they ran out of wine, because the wine provided for the wedding was all finished, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, why turn to me? But his mother said to the servants, just do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone jars standing there, which were meant for the ablutions that are customary among the Jews, and each could hold well, 20 or 30 gallons. Draw some out now, he told them, and take it to the steward. They did this, and the steward tasted the water, and it had turned into wine. Having no idea where it came from, because only the servants who had drawn the water knew that, the steward called the bridegroom and said, you know, people, they generally serve the best wine first and keep the cheaper cert till all the guests have had plenty to drink. But you have kept the best wine to last until now. And this was the first of the signs given by Jesus. It was given at Cana in Galilee. He let his glory be seen, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. If you'd like to sit down, please. With the family... We chose the wedding feast of Cana for a very good reason. First of all, because Jesus had a great sense of humour. He arrived with a crowd of his own his disciples, and they probably drank the place dry. But he wasn't going to avoid a party, so he turned the water into wine and made a party for them all. There's two things Brendan was famous for. The father of the bride. Can you imagine what he said at the wedding feast of Cana? with the amount of wine that he was after getting. It was not suit him down to a tea. And of course, the other one was that he was a wonderful priest in his own way. Uh, and, um, and, but he would have loved that. But lastly, and most importantly of all, he was the best sober drunk I ever saw in my life. He could have pretended to have taken the six barrels of wine himself, and he'd have thought he was as drunk as a, a coot, but you'd have known eventually 
that he was as sober as a judge. He was just absolutely marvellous as doing that. So he thought that the wedding feast of Cana with the wine was a great summary of Brendan's life and a poor old bottler here beside me as well. See, Butler was a wonderful. Butler was the awkward little devil of a cub that is still within his own. You know, the most important part of our lives is that to try and discover the child within. If I can discover the child within me, I understand greatly about myself. And also, it's where I find peace. The innocence, the beauty, the dependence, the vulnerability of the child within is where we find strength and courage and hope. It's actually where we find ourselves. And Brendan knew that, and he brought Bottler out every night to remind us of that. Because I think Bottler, as, as um, Eileen said to me the other day, she says, I've lost two, you know, not one. I've lost Brendan and I've lost Bottler. And in fact, when Amanda rang me the other day to tell me that uh, Brendan had died, she introduced herself. I don't know if she realized it, but she introduced herself. Brian, she says, I'm Amanda, Butler's daughter. Now, it wasn't Brendan's daughter, but Butler's daughter. So, he, he, you know, the real person of the child within was encompassed brilliantly in the wonderfulness of the many smart-ass things that Butler said that we'd all love to have said and secretly did say under our breath. It's a long time since the first night I met, or the first afternoon I met Brendan and Eileen. It's 47 years ago almost. It was a St. Stephen's Day. And the great Val Joyce was doing airs and races on RT, in RTE on a St. Stephen's Day. And it was down in the old studios in Henry Street before they got Porsche and went to Mount Rose. And it was down in that Henry Street, long dark corridors where Terry Wogan and Brendan Balfe and Gabe Bourne and Larry Gowen, where they all started, really, where, where great radio was great radio. And Val was in there on St. Stephen's Day on his own, and he knew he could get nobody else. So he phoned me in Mount August to see what I'd come down, because he knew I wouldn't get home, and I'd be doing nothing anyway, and I didn't drink, and I'm, I would be likely to be sober. He brought Brendan and Eileen in because Brendan and I started off in the business at that time. So we changed the program that day from airs and races to what it should have been known, airs and graces. And that was the first time that I met Brendan and Eileen all those years ago. And I can honestly say that I never had a dull, a bad, embarrassing, other than a joyful, happy moment every time I met Brendan, or indeed Eileen, or any of the family for that matter, from that day to this. This is the only sad time I've ever met them, really. When I was listening to the radio during the week, and I was, you know, I was, I was afraid of my life, somebody was going to ring me up and ask me what I thought, because I didn't want to think. I wanted to, I just wanted to be alone with my own thoughts. I didn't want to have to share them with anybody. And luckily, I was doing other funerals and things, so I didn't have to share them with anybody until I had come to terms with the loss of a, of a dear and wonderful friend and a wonderful, generous, beautiful man that was, uh, no, that is Brendan Grace, because he insisted that he not be ever referred to as was or past tense, but in the present tense. Butler is alive, Brendan is alive in the memories. And I'll tell you why. The wonderful poet Brendan Kennelly. Um, has a beautiful poem when his father died. It's a fantastic, lovely poem, and I'm sure most of you know it. Most of you know it, I'm sure. Um, and in memory of my father. And in that poem, he talks about his memory, his lasting memory of his father after he had died, with his politics and speeches with John B. Keane and all the stuff that they had down in, in Listowa. And he, the wee man was a great man for whistling and dancing. And the memory that Brendan Kennelly had of his father was of his father dancing on the flagstone of the kitchen, whistling and dancing to his own music, and in the colossal words of Brendan Kennelly, always in tune with himself. Isn't that a beautiful thing, isn't it? Isn't it just a colossal thing? Now, was Brendan Grace any different? Always in tune with himself. 
And Brendan Kennedy spoke, uh, <coughs> told me one time, I, I was talking to him about the lovely poem, <coughs> and he said a thing that I hadn't thought of at all, which I should have. And he said, of course, Brian, you should know what that means, which, because I didn't, it made me feel guilty. And he said, what did Jesus say the night before he died? He said, do this in memory of me. And what are we going to do here today? We're going to utter those same words. Do this in memory of me. And what has happened since the news spread about Brendan Grace's death? Everything has been a happy memory. And Brendan Kennedy says, as long as a man's memory is alive, the man will never die, or the woman will never die. As long as a person's memory lives, and as long as we live, Brendan Grace will never die because all of us have enthusiastic and brilliant and long-lasting, life-lasting, life-changing memories of the wonderful man that he was. The humanity of the man, the generosity of the man, the goodness of the man. Every person that came on Liveline or any of the other programs had nothing but happy, good, beautiful memories of Brendan Grace. Does it matter what God thinks after that? It doesn't, because that's exactly his legacy to the world. Goodness, laughable, generosity, taking away our pain. All his vocation in life was quite simply, nothing more, nothing less, than to lift the gloom of the nation, to lift the gloom of the people who came to see him. No matter how he felt, and I was with him in the dressing room, and him in agony going out to do a concert, or do a show, and usually the theater. And Brendan was struggling even to walk as far as the, the, the stage. Did you know that when he got up on the, on the stage? No. He gave on every bit of himself because, as he used to say, they don't pay to hear about my ills. They pay to be forget, forget about their own. His only vocation in life was to make people happy. Can you think of anyone that has such a great vocation in life than that? Than Brendan Grace. I happen to know because I've lived half my life in the north and half my life in the south. And, and the, the point of it is, it didn't matter where you went. You could go to Kerry or you could go to Belfast, you could go to Enniskillen or you could go to Ennis. It didn't matter. Everybody loved Brendan Grace. Protestant, Catholic, young, old, cultured, uncultured. It didn't matter what they were, educated or non-educated. Butlers or Brendan. They all loved Brendan. He unified the country and sent them home with a smile on their face, no matter where they were. And many a night in the north when I did see him, I was amazed at the people who turned up to see Brendan Grace. We had known and with the family on many occasions. There's one famous occasion when his great mother, Chrissy, died. And it was a, an extraordinary moment in my own life and, uh, and in Brendan's life. Bre Chrissy was in her ladies' hospital in Hard Cross for a long time for, before she died, and I used to visit her because I was parish priest in the area in Mount Argus at the time. And I used to go down to see her. We got to be good friends before she died. Um, and she had asked that she be buried in Mount Argus, and she had asked that I do the funeral for her. Um, and she could have, would have been many friends of Brendan's who would have, did it, would have done the funeral, and that would have been fine with me too, but she had asked because she had got to know me. But at the same time, would you believe it, in November 1987, at the very same time, didn't um, um, John O'Grady, God be good to him too, be, be kidnapped by a man whose name I'm not going even going to mention. And uh, the day before Chrissy was to come to Mount Argus Church, I got a phone call from Austin Dara, wondering if I would possibly go to help and mediate the release of John O'Grady because they had got, as you remember, his fingers in an envelope in the post. And with the promise that his legs would come with the money, he didn't come afterwards. And I had to phone Brendan, I had his phone in that day, and I said, Brendan, I'm not going to be able to be in my darkness tomorrow evening to receive Chrissy. I'm heartbroken about it, and I can't tell you where I'm going to be, but if, you know, by lunchtime tomorrow, you will know where I am, and, and you'll understand then. It was the only time he, he took the huff. Now, he didn't know what it was for now, of course, but he said, damn it, he said, uh, she wanted you to do a funeral, surely you're not going to let my mother down. 
And I said, I hope not, but, you know, just, just hold your own. So that was fine. So, as you know, I went off the next morning with a million and a half and seven suitcases down to Cork. Um, and as Noel B. Ginnett, he said, and I think Noel in the place, as Noel B. Ginnett, he said to me afterwards, you're some idiot. He said, you were looking for a million and a half from Mount Argus and you gave it back after you didn't get it. <laughs> so, uh, we trust Noel to get it right too, of course. Um, and, um, and, and that was, so eventually, I'm not going to go into that story, but eventually I was able to get up in time to receive Chrissy's remains into Mount Argus Church by sheer luck. Nothing more. By sheer luck, John O'Grady was found at the time. And we said Chrissy's Mass and we had it all. And Brendan never forgot that. He always he was going to put it in his book, but he said he wouldn't, uh, that story. So there's a lovely thing about a man. He, 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 you know, he wasn't worried about anything, but he wanted to do what his mother had asked. And friendship didn't come between it. If I wasn't going to do it, he was going to be, you know. The only thing I did know is that if I wasn't there, I would have been dead, um, because I was supposed to be dead anyway. Um, many a bishop would have been happy <laughs> since. <laughs> and Brendan was the kind of man, I remember him coming to the Mass in the Grand one day when I was up in Inniskin, and Amanda was living up north, and he was himself and Eileen were staying with Amanda, and he came up to, uh, he came to Mass, 12 o'clock Mass, where I was there. Now, I didn't know he was there, full church. And it was, so during the thing, I, the sermon, didn't I attempt a joke? Now, I'm not very good at jokes. I'm not good at all at jokes. And I, it was just a little light thing in the middle of it all. Didn't know a thing until communion time. And who came up from the back of the church? Only Brendan Grace. He puts his tongue out, sticks his hand out for communion, and then says, Brian, leave the jokes to me. <laughs> the body of Christ, amen. <laughs> so, anyway, we got him, I got my own back in him because I asked him to tell a joke at the back of the chapel afterwards, and he was able to do it. So, you know, there's some lovely other stories, but we're not going to go into any of them. It just shows you that, you know, Brendan, on the stage or off the stage, was just a lovely, lovely <coughs> man. Brendan the man, you know, Brendan the man was wonderful. He, he was modern, but he was old style. He was uh, loyal, but knew his own mind. He was honourable, uh, but knew that he wasn't going to be walked on. He had an incredible balance when, in his own life. Much of it through Eileen too, I know that, as he would be the first to say. Uh, much of it through, as he would have known that. But his manners, his views, his style was just wonderful. It, it, he was the kind of man who could come out and imitate a priest and the priest didn't feel embarrassed. Do you know, and th that doesn't happen too often. I'm not going to say anything about me holding out uh, being a parish priest who's a sinner. Um, uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. Brendan was a man who could make us laugh at religion, but he never made a laugh of religion. Now that's an incredible gift. Why? Because he respected religion and he also didn't stand in the way of the pomposity of the Father Stack uh, or, or, or any of the others. The pomposity, he made them look ridiculous. And that's all he had to do. He didn't have to say any more. But he also knew what was right. And that's a brilliant gift to him. But I think, you know, the lovely thing about Brendan was this. There's not a person in this church, I would say, who didn't receive at some stage a word of gratitude from Brendan Grace at some stage. It didn't matter what you said or played a record or made a mention of the Sunday word or whatever it was, just do some little thing and you'd get this lovely big floral, florid type of writing which he had, beautiful writing, and you'd get a big card, sometimes you get a DVD. I actually know one journalist who got a bottle of brandy and a, a box of cigars. Now where Brendan got them, I don't know. Uh, but when he was giving them away, it was wonderful as well. But he always was grateful for everything you did. Thomas Merton, the fantastic mystic writer, probably the best spiritual writer of the 20th century, Seven Story Mountain and all of those. And he, he said a most wonderful thing. He said that unless you're grateful in life, religion and prayer is a waste of time. Without gratitude, it's a sham. And he said, if you want to sum up 
what true religion is in a word, it is an attitude of gratitude. Merton said that in the 50s. Brendan Grace lived it to the day he died. Gratitude for his family. Gratitude for his fans. Gratitude for the most his grandchildren. Gratitude to the nurses and doctors as he lay dying. They were crying because Brendan was going because he had shown them so much respect and so much gratitude for what they had done to him. And I think that's the best prayer that he ever had. He was never hurt for, he, he always, we spoke a lot about humor and, and jokes. He, he, he had to be, he, 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 he loved all comedians as I do myself. He used to say to me, I, I, I wish you'd come to every show because every joke I tell I can hear you laughing above everybody else. And I'd like to bring you around with me. And that's probably true, but, but he said, you know, and I used to say to him at near the end of his day, I remember doing, being with Hal Roach's, Hal Roach's funeral, Darren McCarthy and myself did Hal Roach's funeral, and, and Brendan got up and spoke the, the eulogy at Hal, Hal Roach's funeral, because uh, he, he respected Hal Roach so much. And he almost became like Hal Roach, near the end of his day, his, his clip delivery was, respect for the man that he liked, liked so much and um, as he did uh, for Harry Bailey he was also another wonderful 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 Brendan was very good to Harry Bailey at the end of his life a wonderful wonderful comedian he, he was in the he was in the he was in the streamline of great comedy comedy that took reality made it ridiculous made us laugh and made us change that's comedy but the great test of any person, the great test of any person is, how do we die? What somebody doesn't know is that there are four versions of the passion of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Four versions for each of the evangelists. No two of them are the same. And some of them Christ dies in agony. And some of them Christ dies in confusion. And some of them Christ dies, and one of them Christ dies by saying, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. What's, that, what's the evangelist telling us? They're telling us that there is no right way to die. Just the way you are is the way to die. And none of us knows how it's going to happen, or how it's going to come. Brendan was the luckiest man in the world, in that he got word that he was going to die in a short time. Broke the hearts of his family, as it did the rest of us who knew about him. But Brendan, the family told me, took one day in utter depression. I think that's the only word you could say about it. Almost impossible to communicate. In agony, working his way through the purgatory of what was happening to him. One day. The next day he got up and said, I'm going to die, so I might as well enjoy what I've left. <laughs> and he had a last supper. Would you guess what the Last Supper contained? A Chinese takeaway <laughs> with his family. I hope he didn't say far Q in it. <laughs> I said far Q in case you're wondering. <laughs> no, on Brendan's, Brendan's wonderful uh, story of the Chinese restaurant and the Chinese wonderful thing. And he then said to his family, we're going to be together and enjoy every moment we have left. What a fantastic insight to the way we should die and the way we shouldn't die. And Brendan then had happiness, peace, acceptance, joy. And the family said there was a crucifix on the wall and he never took his eyes off that crucifix. And he passed away delightfully at peace with the God that he knew was going to welcome him in to meet his father and mother whom he was looking forward to seeing again. What a lovely way to die. You know, I just say one thing. During that time, the family prayed a little prayer, which I'm going to have to read from over here. And this is the final bit. The family every day prayed a prayer from blessing, Benedictus, excuse me, by John O'Donnell for the dying. And that was what kept them going. That's what kept Brendan going. And I think 
We're going to pray it together today. I'll pray it for you today. In memory of a wonderful man. Just quietly as I go over there, let me go over there and read this beautiful prayer. Try to take it in if you don't mind. Because this is special. As John O'Donoghue was special himself. But think of the man who was able to recognize the beauty of this. And the family that thought of praying it with him. It's called For the Dying. May death come quietly and gently towards you leaving you time to make your way through the cold embrace of fear to the place of inner tranquility. May death arrive only after a long life to find you at home among your own with every comfort and care you require. May your leave-taking be gracious, enabling you to hold dignity through the awkwardness and illness. May you see the reflection of your life's kindness and beauty in all the tears that fall for you. As your eyes focus on each face, may your soul take its imprint, drawing each image within as companions for the journey. May you find for each one you love a different locket of jeweled words to be worn around the heart to warm your absence. May someone who knows and loves you, the complex village of your heart, be there to echo you back to yourself and create a sure world raft to carry you to the further shore. May your spirit feel the surge of true delight when the veil of the visible is raised and you glimpse again at the living faces of departed family and friends. May there be some beautiful surprise waiting for you inside death. Something you never knew or felt, <clears throat> which with one simple touch absolves you of all the loneliness and loss as you quicken within the embrace for which your soul was eternally made. May your heart be speechless at the sight of the truth of all your belief had hoped, your heart breathless in light and lightness, where each and every thing is at last its true self. Within that serene belonging that dwells beside you, on the other side of what we see. Brendan, our friend, God bless you, and thanks. Thank you. Do you need a little moment to think, or are you all right to pray? You're all right to pray? Well, if you'd like to stand, fine. If you don't, it's all right. If you're happy, you're sitting, do ahead. But usually we stand for the prayers of the faith. And I'd like to ask uh, Pat Power from the Red Cow, Ronan Collins, of course, from RTE, Carmel Myler, if she's here, um, from the family, and Brendan Singleton from Erling is to come and be the prayer of the faith. So before we begin, just let you know, maybe maybe close your eyes and get in touch with the Spirit of God within you. We're praying for ourselves here too, you know. But it's, the words we say are not important. It's just communicating and being at one with God. Lord, open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. We pray for all who May their tears be wiped away, and may their mourning be turned into joy. 
We give thanks for the love which Brandon showed during his life. May he know the perfection and fulfillment of that love in heaven. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously. For those who nursed Brandon in his illness, that all of them will be rewarded for their greatness and care. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And quietly, while uh, our prayers stay and pray with us, just quietly think, what prayer would you like to offer to Brendan? I'd like to say thanks and return the gratitude that he's shown for the laughs, for the charitable work that he did, for the people he helped, for the sacrifices he made, for the sacrifices his family made so that he could be with us. Can each of you have your own thought and prayer? Lord, we offer to you these prayers that were spoken, and we offer you even more so the silent prayer of our heart for which we cannot find words but which you understand and know. And we offer all of them through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to take your seats. And now we have our offertory procession. And uh, I'd like to ask his cousins, uh, Sheila Grace and Kerry Grace, uh, to come with the gifts that they brought to the altar.
didn't get to make Father Stack, you remember? Uh, uh, thanks to Red and to um, Eugene for that beautiful rendering. Red has been an incredibly long and close friend of Brendan's, and like the rest of us, his heart is breaking today. And you, I think you feel that warmth in the beauty of his song. So let us all now pray together that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. As we present to you these offerings, Lord, for the salvation of our own soul and for the salvation of our dear friend Brendan, we ask you that he who didn't doubt your son to be his living saviour may find now the most merciful judge and the most welcome host. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. In him the hope of the blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of death might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful people, Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for us in heaven. And so with gratitude and praise we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And I think because of the situation, just remain seated uh, for our today. You are holy indeed, Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. You never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a perfect sacrifice may be offered to your name. And therefore, Lord, we humbly ask you, by the same Spirit, graciously to make holy these gifts that you have brought to us and that we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, Jesus himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing. He broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come again.
As we celebrate the memorial of his saving passion, of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, that recognizing the victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with this Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with Mary, the mother of God, with her, apostle, with her husband, Joseph, and with all the saints, especially St. Brendan, St. Philip, and all our personal saints, on whose constant intercession we rely for help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, which are serving Pope Francis, our Pope, and Dermot, the Archbishop of this diocese, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people your son has gained for you. Now we'll pause for a moment and pray fervently for the repose of the soul of Brendan Grace. We're all gone to God before him, especially his parents. And all who you've called from this world to yourself, Lord. Grant that Brendan, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. When from the earth he will raise up in the flesh all who have died, and change our lowly bodies after the pattern of his own glorious body. To all departed sisters and brothers who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from every eye. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all ages and praise you without end, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world everything that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. So, sometimes when we're, especially when we're sick, we find it difficult enough to pray. Sometimes we're not sick at all, we find it difficult enough to pray. But you know, Jesus has said and understood that. And he left us a prayer which not only told us how to pray, but actually told us what to pray for. We acknowledge God's goodness first of all, our Father in heaven. And then we move from that, knowing that we want to do God's will no matter what it is. We don't pray to change God's mind. We pray to open our minds to what God wants. And then we pray that we'll have enough to do us for today, our daily bread. And most of all, we need to be able to pray that we will be able to forgive those who have hurt us and to accept forgiveness from those who have hurt us too. And because if we can't forgive, we're not likely to be able to receive forgiveness ourselves. And finally, to keep us safe from anything that was harm us in life. You know, when you've done that, there's nothing left to pray for, which is why Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer. And so let's stand together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil and grant us peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be free from sin and safe from anything that would distress us as we await the blessed hope and coming 
of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as I come from the north and live in the north now, we'd like to pray for peace. Maybe we need to pray for peace more than in the north. So why don't we just pray together? Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And now, as we come to the lovely part where we exchange peace, you know, funeral mass is a great time, a timely reminder that we should be at peace with everybody. So you can give each other a high five, a big hug, you can go for a water sport, make it rain as you share peace with one another.
Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. If you'd just like to maybe sit down, please. And the most important guest of the day of all, as Brendan so well knew, the presence of Jesus in the form of bread and wine. And we come to receive him. And everybody's welcome to receive Jesus. Please feel free to come and receive Jesus and be one with each other and one with Brendan. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life.
beautiful part of the service of all uh, when we have is family we have um, Amanda Grace Melanie Bradley and Brendan Patrick and of course his road manager for God knows along Brian Keane are all going to come up and say a few maybe more than a few words it's your funeral it's your father you speak as long as you like so come on up each one of you Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian Keane. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I worked for Brendan for 37 years. My adventure with Brendan began when I was 16 years old. I was working at a dad's petrol station in Sagart, and Brendan had recently moved into the area. One day, he rolled in to the garage in a beautiful big green jag and said to me, fill her up both tanks <laughs> and I thought now that's class that's flash that's Brendan Grace and I loved it after getting to know him on his many visits to the garage he offered me a job for 30 pounds a night which was a fortune as I was only earning 40 pounds a week at the time I jumped at the chance, and it wasn't long before I was travelling to gigs, doing this and that. I ended up becoming his sound engineer, tour manager, and even his helicopter pilot. I travelled all over the world with Brendan, and because I was often known to, as his other wife, because I spent more time with him than his loving wife Eileen, and we even slept together on one occasion. <laughs> Hang on, hang on. In fairness, this is only because it was a very expensive hotel we were staying in. And in uh, my room would have cost an extra $350. <laughs> and to use Brennan's words, they can feck off. <laughs> so yes, we shared a bed, although I must admit, we were both very grateful for our large bolster pillow, which we put to good use as a great wall between us. <laughs> Brendan was up front and centre for all the milestones in my life. On my 21st birthday, he turned up and sang. Now you might think this is not a big deal for an entertainer like Brendan, but his beloved mother, Chrissy Grace, had died that same day, and although I offered to cancel the whole thing, he insisted on coming along. He sang, entertained, and mingled with 
family members and put on a brave face like a true pro he was. Brendan also threw me a rather memorable stag party in Kitty O'Shea's pub, com complete with stripper. Sorry, God. <laughs> he, said, he said to me, I booked her for you because she had the biggest pair of big blue eyes <laughs> I've ever seen, and she did. <laughs> Brennan was even my best man at my first wedding, and thankfully my relationship with him went on to be happy, supportive, and loving, unlike the marriage. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to, spend, to be able to spend some time with Brendan in the past, in the last few weeks. And it has to be said, he remained humorous, kind, and brave self. When he asked me to speak today, I agreed and asked him, was there anything else he wanted me to do? And he said, oh yes. Set up my merchandising table at the back of the church <laughs> and you could shift some of those last of the DVDs and cut the priest in for 20%. <laughs> and another strange request he had was, he did also request that the invoice for masses to be made out not for funeral services but for chauffeur services so we could claim back the VAT. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thanks, George. <laughs> Brendan gave and did a, little, a did a lot for charity. The happiest I saw him was when he was able to surprise a group of people in an old folks' home on the way to a gig, or especially when he came across people with special needs. He loved to chat, have the crack, giving them joke books, videos, or whatever the hands could carry. He delighted in their reaction to how happy he made them. You know, everyone has their thing that makes them happy. Some men is around the golf or fishing, but for Brendan, this was the ultimate high, making special people feel special. Brendan also loved animals, especially the stray unloved ones. Many is the time I was made to turn around the van or the car, and he uh, spotted a stray dog on the side of the road. He would go on, he would go into the nearest garage and buy dog food and a plastic fork and proceed back to the animal in question to feed it. Brendan was also obsessed with throwing bread to the birds or anything that flew. <laughs> On one very funny occasion, we were flying to pick him up from the Mamada Hotel in Spanish Point. Now to say Brendan had a good sub on him was an understatement. BG always said there were three basic stages of drunkenness. Drunk, scuttered, and transmoglified. <laughs> and on this occasion, Brendan was transmoglified. When he saw the helicopter coming into land, he ran into the kitchen of the hotel, grabbed a sliced pan, and proceeded <laughs> to throw bread at the chopper. <laughs> it was hilarious. He would have had done anything to make us laugh, and always did. The late Father Sean Breen, the, the racing priest, who was a great friend of Brendan Lyling's, and in fact, he was the priest who married him, he always said, yes, Brendan gave a lot of his money to sick animals, although in fairness, he didn't know they were sick at the time he was backing them. <laughs> In my, final, uh, my few final visits to Brendan, I was trying to express my immense gratitude for all he had done for me and how, how I had done well in life and was so grateful to him. 
He simply stopped me in a typical gracious response and said, you never got anything from me that you didn't work hard for and earned. This summed up Brennan to me, so gracious, always happy to give someone else the praise. I have absolutely no doubt that heaven is a funnier place now and that our sad loss will be definitely there again. And I'm going to leave you now with the words Brennan uttered every single night at the end of the gig. Good night, God bless and stay calm. Slán of all BG. All right, so where do I begin? Um, there's that question again. What was it like to be Brendan Grace's son? You know, I never knew how to answer that question growing up or how they expected me to answer it, so I would always just shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. Because that's not a typical question for a kid to be asked. As I got older, I realized that they just wanted to know what it was like to be Brendan Grace, the entertainer's son. The answer would be as unique as anyone's answer would be if asked the question, what was it like to be your father's son or daughter? People young and old would ask me, is he funny at home? And the answer is yes, he's freaking hilarious at home. But in a completely different kind of way. Many people know Brennan Grace and the kind man he is, but I know my dad. I know the man behind the microphone. I know the man who liked to wear as little clothing as possible while walking around the house to the point that my friends would come over to the house and laugh because my dad was pretty much Tarzan. Walking around with the cordless phone clipped on his underwear the man had an arsenal of gadgets, okay, that ranged from pocket-sized TVs with two channels, portable stovetops in case you ever needed to fry an egg in the back of a Subaru in a hurry, flashlights, lots of flashlights, and those doorstops that had the alarm on them. Those never worked. I know the man who brought me along with him to gigs in the summer, and he always made me feel like I was a part of it all. He always loved to throw me into the mix when he was signing autographs, and he would put his arms around me and look down at me and say, he's the real Brendan Grace. True story. He was never too busy for me, even when he was busy, and he always had a job for me. So much so that whenever he needed something done, he would jokingly yell, slaves! and I would be at his beck and call. <clears throat> Lost my spot there, guys, give me a break. <clears throat> so he was never too busy. I was his roadie, his salesman, in training, and his fetcher of Club Orange and a Kit Kat at the end of every show. I know a simple man who enjoyed simple things like ham sandwiches, cup of tea, or watching old comedy reruns late at night until he fell asleep. And I know that because on many occasions, I was the little boy who would be laid back on the bed or on the couch watching them with him. And damn, my dad could snore. My mom loved that. I know a man who would take my brother and I down to the train station where we would stand over the overpass and feel the excitement as the trains rushed underneath us at 120 miles per hour. I know the man who would annihilate a crowd with laughter on a nightly basis and come off stage sweating like he just put three hours into the gym. And he would still have time for all his fans, young or old, sick or well. I saw that firsthand. It didn't matter to him. 
and it taught me a lot. It taught me about what having a sense of humor actually meant and how important it is to laugh your ass off as much as you can. My dad was a master at his craft, and I'm not standing up here as his son, I'm also standing up here as one of his truest fans. I know a busy man, a famous man, a man who sacrificed a lot so that he could give his family a life that he could only dream of having when he was a kid, and he did a whole lot more than that. My dad is the kindest, gentlest, most compassionate person I've ever known. Everything he did was designed to unite people, and not just through his comedy, but by the way he treated people. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that he never forgot where he came from. Relationships are what meant the most to my dad. His relationships with people, his fans, his friends, his business partners, his relationship with God, and most importantly, his relationship with his family. So today, I'm proud to say I am my dad's son. He would call me his son of Ireland, even though I have a full-blown American accent. And I'm even more proud to carry on his name, even though there isn't a chance in hell that I could fill up even a quarter of his shoes. And I'm quite okay with that. I don't have to, and he wouldn't expect me to. And lastly, I want to thank you all, and everybody out there standing out there, for showing up here today. To his family, his friends, and to his fans, your support to my family is much appreciated. And today we remember my dad in the way I know he would want to be remembered, and that is simply with a smile in your heart. Thank you. Now I wish I had a one the rock, paper, scissors to go first, friends. That was lovely. This is a day we all dread as a daughter or son having to say farewell to a parent. I learned that word from my dad. It's farewell, he'd say, not goodbye. But where do you start when trying to cover everything this amazing man has meant to you? How do you do him the justice that he so deserves? When Amanda posed the idea of answering the question we've been asked all our lives, what's it like to be Brenda Grace's daughter or son? I thought it was a great idea. We've been asked it so often over the years, and growing up, I usually said, that's yeah, normal, it's ordinary, because I didn't want to be any different to anyone else's child. But having spent the last two weeks reminiscing with my dad and my family, I realized that being Brendan Grace's daughter was far from ordinary. It was actually extraordinary, and mostly for the simplest of reasons that you won't expect. Being Brendan Grace's daughter is Sunday dinners, surrounded by family with a dozen roasties on dad's plate, and saving the skin off the chicken for him and him alone. It's like the most magical Christmases one could ever have experienced, led by dad, who was every bit as excited as an adult as we were as kids, if not more. It's like unconditional kindness, even to complete strangers, many of whom are reaching out to us with their stories of the many acts of kindness that dad did for them. Like Brian said, it's watching him run into the shop to get a can of dog food for a stray dog, or bringing the dog home if the shop was closed. <laughs> Feeding the birds every chance he got because he truly believed that he was a robin in his previous life and told us that he would come to us in that form in his next life. Being Brandon Grace's daughter was sweets magically appearing from our ears as kids and suspending our disbelief every time, even long after we figured out the trick, a tradition he carried on with his grandkids. It's watching him sit at a table for hours, writing cards of gratitude, love, or just a general thinking of you to fans, family, and friends, because he knew it could brighten the day and nothing made him happier than that. It's like limping on demand at my dad's request 
as he rented a wheelchair every time we went to Disney World, long before he needed one, just so that we could get off the front of the lines. <laughs> he'd look at me and he'd say, Mel, do the Abbey. And suddenly I'd pull off the best impression of a footballer with a torn ligament you've ever seen. And him playing the role of the sympathetic parent, pulling faces of compassion to meet the band. It's watching his and Mam's dedication and devotion to each other, in good times and bad. And watching his hopelessly romantic gestures to her up until his final hours. It's receiving packages from him to my home, addressed to the oddest of names, most of which I can't say here on the altar. But if you'd like to come to me later, I will divulge. Being Brendan Grace's daughter is simply like being enveloped by a massive hog from a mighty protector for 41 years. Thank you for teaching me how to perform, not only on stage, but how to be a professional off stage too. Thank you for passing down the ability to be compassionate, give the benefit of the doubt to others, and bring so much joy. Thank you for your super optimism, using phrases like, if I ever die, right up to the very end. Thank you for the years of generosity to us, your extended family, your fans, bringing laughter into homes particularly appreciated by people during difficult times. The lives you've touched have been forever changed by your presence in them. I knew my life would never be the same again or without your physical presence. But I believe the promise you made when you said that you would never leave us spiritually. To most, you're a legend in show business, but to me, you are and always will be a legend of the dead. You've certainly earned your final bow. Rest easy, Dad. Hello, uh, my name is Bradley Grace, um, and um, a, a eulogy is an unusual thing. Its intent is to convey to an audience the essence of who someone is or was. And that's a difficult thing to do for anyone. And when I sat down to undertake the heartbreaking business of writing my dad's eulogy, I was quickly faced with what seemed to be an insurmountable task. Over the years, I've been asked more times than I can count and by more people than I can fathom some version of this question. What is it like to have Brendan Grace as your dad? And honestly, I never knew how to answer the question, because it just kind of made me feel uncomfortable. In a way, though, the answer to that question in and of itself is a eulogy. So as I'm here and privileged enough to have such an audience, I shall now attempt to answer that question once and for all, and in doing so, eulogize my father. It was never lost on me how famous Dad is and how loved he is by so many, most of whom I don't even know. I was fully aware, even from an age where upon seeing him on the telly, I would break my brain trying to figure out who he got in the bleeding thing. <laughs> but it never changed how I viewed him, really. To me, he was simply me dad. He's generous, wise, confusing, beautifully strange, and yes, hilarious. You see, dad is such a good comedian because being funny is as natural to him as drinking water is to anyone else. It's effortless and so ingrained in who he is that it could only come to pass that he be regarded the Grand Master of Irish Comedy. That is a title he earned through intensely hard work, utilizing a skill set that was innate and deeply rooted in his psyche, but which he crafted to perfection nonetheless. Our house was and is filled with laughter. So in that sense, the answer to the question is, Having Brendan Grace as a dad is fun.
Another element to that, and a part of him who I'm sure many, many of you have all experienced, is his kindness. I would be hard pressed to find a person in this church today who hasn't at some point received a letter or a package from dad containing a message that could be as short as a sentence, but as meaningful as a book. Perhaps you were ill, or a family member was ill, or maybe you were living abroad and he wanted you to just tell them that something from home. He would go out of his way to send it and find absolute joy in doing so. He spent much of his free time engaged in this kind of kindness towards people, and he did not do so in the pursuit of reciprocity. He did it because he gen it genuinely made him feel good. Dad loves to make people smile. So in that sense, the answer to the question is, having Brendan Grace as a dad is experiencing unbridled, pure kindness. Dad, like one of his favorite foods, is like an onion. He has many layers, but unlike the onion, each layer is quite different. To break him into his many parts that make him up would simply take too long, so I'll, I'll try to condense it as best I can. There's Dad the comedian, the celebrity, the funny man, and there's Dad the adoring, loving, fiercely loyal husband. There's Dad the family man and a friend, there's Dad the dreamer, the fixer, the attainer of goals, and there's Dad the giver, the lover, the surprisingly often shy, and always pure at heart. He encompasses so many different qual uh, qualities that it's easy to find your heart filling up quickly in his presence, which is what hurts so much now in his absence. So to answer the question here, having Brendan Grace as a dad is fulfilling and all-encompassing. My mom told me a story the other day of a time not too long ago when she was driving her car to the shops. And she noticed people every now and then kind of motioning to her, as if there was something on the roof that she was unaware of. Upon arriving at her destination, she got out of the car, only to find a crumb of remains of a bachelor strewn about the roof of the car, trailing down towards the back window. You see, Dad was an avid bird feeder, but it didn't end with simply throwing bread to the birds like a normal person. One of Dad's more preferred methods was emptying the contents of the bread bin onto the roof of the car and dispersing the bread to the birds at a high rate of speed and over a large area. <laughs> to him, this seemed more appropriate and efficient means to feed the birds, much to the chagrin of my mortified mother, as you can imagine. I once remarked, you know, Dad, you probably killed more birds than you fed with that system. He would simply smile and reply, ah, no, they loved it. Dad is also a collector of things, not antiques or art or classical works of literature, but of plastic bags from his local grocery shop in Florida or empty butter containers and Ziploc bags, which he always finds, to his credit, great and often ingenious uses for. It's a strange thing to be brought to tears at the sight of an empty, I can't believe it's not butter container. <laughs> but for now, that's where I am. And to grieve dad, emotions conjured by an empty butter container just have to be part of the process. So to answer the question in this context, having Brandon Grace as a dad is to bask in someone's harmless and inexplicably beautiful eccentricities. I want to start closing out with a quick story from just a week or so ago. I was spending the night next to Dad in his hospital bed, just to be there to help him with this and that throughout the night. Though he truly never suffered, the nights brought a certain level of challenges to him, which he managed very well, but appreciated the bit of company to get him through. Anyway, it was early morning, and I was seated in an armchair next to him, awake and writing in my journal, <clears throat> which I make a habit of keeping. And he awoke from what looked to be a very comfortable sleep. And um, as he woke, I looked at him and I said, Dad, you look so content. You must have been having lovely dreams. His reply, which with pen in hand, I was able to write down verbatim after hearing, was as follows. Quote, it's lovely to wake up content, but I don't even dream anymore. I have none left. I've lived them all. 
He spoke like this throughout his entire illness, never complaining, never becoming angry or even hopeless, though he was fully aware of what he faced. He did what Dad always does in the face of adversity. He faced it, head on, and he put his own terms on it, and he did not allow the opposite to occur. The man who often said, if I die, began to reminisce of a wonderfully full and happy life filled with great adventures, love, and triumph. He kept his family close and held us up when it should have been the other way around, and he calmly and often hilariously began telling us how he wished his funeral to play out, and how much he looked forward to reuniting with his own parents and the friends gone before him. He was at peace, and he gave us peace, eternal peace, which is the most beautiful thing a person can do for loved ones that they must leave behind. So, to answer the long and aged question once more, and for the rest of time, having Brandon Grace as a dad is an honor and a source of tremendous unyielding pride. I want to finish with an excerpt from a poem by an unknown author that is titled simply, A Clown's Prayer. The prayer depicts an entertainer speaking to God as he reflects on his life and prepares, prepares for his final act. Dad's faith was strong, and he believed 100% that he would indeed meet his maker in his final act. And when I thought of this beautiful meeting he found such comfort in during his illness, I was struck by the final few lines of the poem, which I will recite to you all now. Never let me forget that my total effort is to cheer people, make them laugh, and to forget momentarily all the unpleasantness in their lives. And in my final moment, May I hear you whisper, when you made my people smile, you made me smile. Thank you, Dad, for a lifetime of laughter and love. Hope you boy. Of something that was a little bit mind blowing. 
um, Matthew Brothers, of course, um, all the drivers that we've had, so, you know, most of which are in our family, um, and um, Pat Power, thank you so much, and Tom Kelly, um, and Patricia, Tom Moran, Tracy Moran, Sheila. Um, we have just been held and continue to be. Larry, Larry, our driver from Galway, who we called John for a while because that was on his name badge. So, thanks, Larry John. Uh, okay, I, I apologize if I am leaving everybody out, but I promise you I will find you <laughs> uh, and I'll, we'll have a word. So, uh, yeah. I just said I would start off with a, uh, a, a quote, I suppose, and it is that nature abhors a vacuum. And uh, our dad was a force of nature. He took up space. And not just in our lives, but in the lives also of so many, many of you here today. And of course, as the lad said, people always asked us, was he funny at home? And I would say, yeah, he was. But he wasn't funny the way he was on stage. Dad was funny in a more odd kind of a way, because Dad was a bit odd. <laughs> and he was a bit of a nonconformist. One of the things I enjoyed most about Dad was his endless gift for amusement. And I will forever be amused particularly by his observations on the feeding of domestic pets. See, I have a cat and I have a dog. And it never ceased to bewilder him why each of my animals had its own bag of food. He'd say to me, why does the cat get them nuts and the dog get them nuts? Why can't they both eat the same nuts? And eventually I just learned to nod and smile and kind of shrug and say, oh, I don't know that. Rather than reasoning with, because Lily is a cat, da, and Ted's a dog, he just throw up his hands and say, yeah, but they don't know that. <laughs> he said, dogs don't know their dogs. <laughs> and it's true. He was right. Dogs do not know their dogs. So you can't argue with that. When it came to food, fussiness was one of the things Dad just could not understand. Even though he was actually quite fussy himself with food. For example... God forbid you didn't have Coleman's English mustard for the ham sandwich, or Branston pickles for the leftovers at Christmas. And we were all trained from a very young age to always have both Y.R. and Chef Brown sauce in the larder because they both serve different purposes, did you know? Another thing that used to both baffle and amuse him, and also really annoy him actually, was when people wouldn't answer their mobile phones. Particularly back in the days before smartphone, before social media, email, WhatsApp, and all that, when phones were just phones. Uh, I was a specific culprit of this. Uh, so he was fascinated, a little bit obsessed with communication. If he wasn't writing to you, as my sibling says, he was ringing you. And uh, every one of us, including my mother, would also admit that there were times he'd have you misered with phone calls. My dad would call you just to tell you he'd call you later. <laughs> he'd answer that phone when he was already on this phone. One time he answered a phone call from me while he was brushing his teeth. And what I was greeted on the other end was, I'll call you back! <laughs> he, just, he couldn't do without the phone. There was no such thing as an answering machine. He had to answer it. And he'd be demented by those of us who wouldn't answer his phone. The air phone. He'd pick up his phone, let's say, the, the old Nokia. And he'd say, see this? See this piece of technology? He says, brilliant. It can connect us to wherever we are, all over the world, at the touch of a button. Anywhere, anytime. If you never turn the fucking thing on, well then all this is, is a useless piece of plastic. <laughs> Dad filled space in a very certain way, and not, in, not just in his own life, or the lives of us as a family, but in the lives of 
many friends and fans all over the world. There was never a time when he wasn't thinking about checking in on or writing to somebody. My dad used to send posts to my dog. Ted Grace. He'd sell a tape of fiber to the inside of the car to tell him Ted to buy your mammy an ice cream. Sometimes do the lotto. And those were the special cards. That was the card in the post that nobody else thought to send. And my dad was always so thoughtful. And the infinity of the space that he filled with his thoughtfulness has become profoundly apparent to me in the days, especially since his passing. The many, many stories we're receiving and hearing tell of bear witness to that. During the final two weeks of Dad's life, his thoughtfulness didn't evacuate our space. Not even the approaching demise, but the approaching of his own demise could extinguish that flame. He was considerate of so many, reaching out, calling who he could, seeing most of who came to visit when he could, even though it exhausted him. The thoughtfulness he held for us, tending to unfinished business, tying up loose ends, planning his own funeral, he did it all. He opened himself up to what was before us all. He let it in. Da filled the space in a way that left, left no room for the unspoken, no room for the unplanned, and very little room for the unexpected. He filled it instead with words, and stories, and hope, and wishes. He filled it with comfort, he filled it with strength, he filled it with wisdom, he filled it with humor. But Dad filled that space most profoundly with courage and with acceptance. <coughs> And of course, he filled it with love. And we filled him with love. And not long before midnight on the 10th of July, as we gathered around his bed, I felt the space opening in that room. And we all did. And there's no doubt in my heart that the heavens opened up for my dad in that moment. And not long after midnight, on the 11th of July, Dad slipped away to begin the work of inhabiting the space in a very different way. A few days before this, I almost lost my bottle. I had a really hard time coming to grips with how I was going to cope with things like to my dad. I couldn't wrap my head around it. But then it occurred to me that I'm only saying goodbye to his body. That's all. Somehow, I formed an understanding that Dad had simply reached the limit of what he could achieve anymore in his human body. That there was greater work to be carried out by him now. There was another purpose, and one which required he transcend his physical body and be free. And then I could accept it. And that's what I believe. I know in my heart, and so, that I am on the cusp of forming a whole new kind of relationship with my father. One that will change my life. But I'm already changed. And if this past month is by his side, is anything to go by, I'm actually excited to see what that change will bring. I had the honor and the privilege of my father's physical presence inhabiting massive space in my life for 43 years. Some of you here have had even more years than this. And I know Dad's passing is leaving a very significant and unsubtle void for us all. So what will become of that space? The temptation might be to fill it with substance or with stuff to make it go away, to make it less hard, less empty, less painful. But I would say don't. Do your best to reserve that space and leave it be. Because what I know for sure is that Dad will continue to fill it. Because he couldn't help himself. One of Dad's superpowers is that he knew how to show up in your time of need. And he will continue to do that. 
So please leave that space for him to do what he has always done best. We have shared our father with you all our lives. Gladly so, and we're willing to share him with you still. Only now there's so much more of him to go around. He is with us all, and he will remain so, always, and in abundance, as long as you hold that space for him. And I know I will. we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ which conquers all things destroy the evil death of son. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord and let perpetual light shine upon him. Receive his soul and present him to God. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Brendan in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed on Brendan in this life and all the goodness that in laughter he brought into our lives. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us to remain, to comfort one another with assurance of faith until we all meet in Christ and we are with our brother Brendan forever in heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. May his soul and all the souls of faithful departed. Mercy of God rest in peace. And now we're about to take Brendan from his church in the Liberties where he was born. And we thank God for the phenomenal, unique, and brilliant gift which the Liberties gave to each of us. And we take him to uh, the crematorium where we pray with the mayor and Finbar Fury will be there. 
there to greet us when we go there. And a final little point I would like to, first of all, thank the people of the Liberties and the people of this area for the incredible performance and welcome and presence that they gave us this day. It was truly magnificent. <laughs> too. I'd like to thank Father Martin. He is just a gem of a priest and was so lovely to us. As were all his parishioners here, all the people who looked after security, they were fantastic. And I forgot to mention earlier the presence of the UN veterans who were here. For all 20 districts of the UN veterans. <laughs> relationship with Brendan and Brendan had with them and he sang them so often. It's so beautiful to see them all here and we should be so proud of what they have done for our country and Brendan was proud. It's lovely to be known as a peacekeeping army. Isn't that fantastic? And long may it be so. So Brendan, we take you to your place of rest and we'll never forget you. God bless you. <laughs>